Look in the background of many a painting by Vermeer and you'll quickly realise that the Dutch Golden Age was obsessed with cartography. Huge maps hang without frames from rollers and globes populate many a canvas, providing a world and sophisticated backdrop to the portraits of plutocrats, dignitaries and noblemen. Indeed, in Europe in the 17th century, anyone who was anyone had a monumental war map on their walls. A map of the world was a symbol of power and wealth at the time of the start of both maritime insurance and the joint stock company, a symbol of the birth of modern business and the beginning of globalisation. And you don't get much more monumental than this, Luis Teixeira's Magna Orbis Terrarum Nova of 1604. The map, printed on 12 sheets, measures nearly by 2 by 3 metres, or 70 by 120 inches, and stands testament to the confidence and ambition of Dutch enterprise. Commissioned in 1602, the year the first joint stock company, the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, was established, the map is both an encyclopedia of Dutch interests in the East Indies and an advertisement for future investment. The vast riches of the Orient are on display in the form of products such as nutmeg, clove, cinnamon and pepper, and exotic species like coral, rhinoceros and um, unicorn. But the map also shows the means to access this wealth. A team of wise Dutch navigators and their instruments are gathered at the Cartouche, and routes to the Indies are shown by both the traditional journeys via the Horn of Africa and the Straits of Magellan, but also by a theoretical northeast and northwest passage, here shown clear of ice and an easy sail for the merchants of Amsterdam. The map is also a veritable catalogue of maritime architecture, showing vessels from all manner of nations, including Arabian dhows, Spanish barks, and Southeast Asian sampans, all watched over by the Dutch fleet. The familiar square-rigged frigates of the Dutch East India Company span the entire globe, sometimes in full sail, sometimes engaged in furious battle, and always shown with the wind in the favour of the VOC. The map is noteworthy for its portrayal of a vast southern continent and its depiction of the Southern Pacific at the dawn of Dutch exploration of Southeast Asia and Australasia. The true form of the island of New Guinea had not yet been ascertained, so, bizarrely, it appears twice, once as an island on the left-hand side of the map, and again as part of the mythical continent of Magellanica on the right. The Gulf of Carpentaria is tantalisingly hinted at in the sweeping bay in Magellanica at the far right of the map. The myth of the great southern continent was propagated by the belief that, in order to balance the earth, there must be a landmass in the southern hemisphere of a size commensurate with that in the north. It was in part this erroneous assumption that spurred Dutch exploration of Australia in the 17th century and Captain Cook's voyages over 100 years later. In fact, it was not until the 20th century and the explorations of Captain Scott and Roald Amundsen that the lands of the Southern Hemisphere were finally charted to any degree of accuracy. Towards the lower corners of the map are representations of the Northern and Southern Hemispheres, and then on the bottom are 10 small panels containing detailed maps of Magellan Strait, Rio de la Plata, Northern Europe, Nevaelet Zemla, and the Straits of Sona, off Java, Anian, Manila, and Gibraltar. A noteworthy feature of the map is that the dedication cartouche and coat of arms appear as pasteovers stuck onto the paper of the map. Whilst we cannot know the reason for this with a certainty, we do know that the map was advertised for sale by both Cornelius Claes in Amsterdam and Johannes Vrintz in Antwerp. Indeed, it appears to have been printed as a collaboration between the two publishers. In 1604, Antwerp was held by the Spanish Netherlands, and so the publisher of this example, which we can see here was Vrintz, includes a dedication to Queen Isabella of Spain and the Spanish coat of arms. Might, perhaps, the same map produced in Amsterdam by Cornelius Claes have had an alternative dedication in arms, possibly those of the States General of the Independent Netherlands in the north. Sadly, we may never know, as no example survives from an Amsterdam printing. Due to the rapid rate of discovery at the beginning of the 17th century, many maps soon lost their value, the owners replacing obsolete maps with new ones. It is likely that this was the fate of the Teixeira map, as when William Janssen made the first documented European landing in Australia in 1606, this map, for all its grandeur, confidence and its wonderful large southern continent, would have looked very outdated, and its impact as a symbol of both status and science diminished. Dutch wall map of the world from this area are incredibly rare. We are only aware of five earlier, and only one, by Petrus Plantius, survived in its original state. The present work is one of only two surviving complete examples.